Good morning. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking today uh, about Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 24. Um, you know, there's some big butts in the Bible. <laughs> some big butts in the Bible. We're going to be talking about a really big butt today. Probably the biggest butt in the Bible is right here in Romans chapter 3. You notice verse 21, Paul says, but now. This is a really big but. Because what Paul is going to do now, is he's going to begin to explain to us God's remedy for our problem. Remember, in the last few chapters, God's been outlining what man's problem is. And it's a big problem. Who can remind us what our problem is according to Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3? Dana? We are completely lost without hope in our sin. And without God, we're all going to hell. Okay, so Stana says we are completely lost, completely without hope, completely and destined for hell. Sinners. We're all a bunch of sinners, and that's evidenced by creation and by God's word and by history and by moral um, behavior of the human race, our own consciences. All of these things Paul said are evidences that we are completely and totally and hopelessly lost. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we can do to fix that? Maybe going to church? No. Dana says no. Nothing we can do to fit. How about keeping the Ten Commandments? How about that? Keeping the Ten Commandments doesn't make you righteous before God? Jenna says no. <laughs> it's a step in the right direction, Fred says. We still we still don't make it to Catalina. Stana says, we still don't make it to Catalina, and that was a reference to a story I told about jumping to Catalina, because Catalina is 10 miles off the coast of California, and if you run off the pier and jump, you might make it 30 feet. That's a long way from Catalina, isn't it? So what Paul is saying is that God's standards are so high, they're actually perfection. You cannot get into heaven unless you are perfect. And Paul says, and we know that none of us are perfect, and we can't do anything to change that. Except now, Paul says, this big but. Verse 21. But now, having said all that before, don't run off and kill yourself because there's no hope for you. He says there is hope for you and for me and for everybody. Because now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now, this verse is actually better translated by a righteousness from God, apart from the law, is revealed. Not the righteousness, but a righteousness from God. Why was it necessary... For God to provide a righteousness apart from the law. Paul makes a pretty big deal of this. But now a righteousness apart from the law is, is revealed. Why is that a big deal? Otherwise, we're not going to have any connection with God. Fred says, otherwise we're not going to have any connection with God. Because we don't have any righteousness, do we? We don't have any standing before God. Paul just said in three chapters that we don't. So there must be some other way that we can be made righteous before God. Because we can't do it on our own. Going to church doesn't do it. Being good doesn't do it. Right? But Paul says there is a righteousness from God that's available to you. A righteousness you don't have, but you desperately need. And it comes from God. That's good news. 
So wasn't the law righteous? He says, but now a righteousness of God apart from the law. This is a righteousness that comes apart from doing good things. Ten commandments, whatever law. Let's just take the Ten Commandments. Let's take the law that God gave. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Weren't those righteous? He says a righteousness apart from the law is revealed. But weren't those righteous things? The problem is we don't do them, right? There's nothing wrong with the law. There's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments, is there? I mean, thou shalt not kill, that's good. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness. Man cannot live up to God's righteous standards. Therefore, there must be... No. There must be another way for us to become righteous before God. And Paul says there is. And it has nothing to do with keeping the Ten Commandments. It has nothing to do with any law or rule or ritual that you think you can follow to make you righteous. Look at page 116 in your guidebook. If you have your guidebook. If not, you can just listen along. That's okay, I'll just read it here. On page 116, at the bottom of the page is a paragraph, and it says, Divine righteousness is apart from the law. This is a righteousness that God provides and has nothing to do with keeping the Ten Commandments or going to church or being good. Paul reminds his readers, and I'm reading now, Paul reminds his readers that God's righteousness is independent of the law as a condition for becoming righteous. The problem with the law is that while it revealed sin, it could not provide the power needed to prevent sin. The law is like a mirror. In it, you discover your face is dirty. But to clean it, you would have to go to the sink and use soap and water. The New Testament abounds with reminders that God's righteousness is apart from the law. Paul himself said that his former righteousness was from the law until he attained true righteousness in Christ. You see, when you go to the mirror and look in the mirror, and you see a dirt smudge on your face, do you go up to the mirror and like rub your face on the mirror to get the dirt smudge off your face? <laughs> Will that get the dirt smudge off your face? Of course not. What do you have to do to get that dirt smudge off your face? You got to go to that sink and turn that water on and you got to get cleansed. Unless you live with Stana, she'll do it for me. <laughs> yeah, she does. Only if you missed it. Only if I missed the spot. But that's what Paul is saying here. The law only reveals the problem. The problem is you can't keep the law. The problem is that you can't keep and measure up to God's righteousness, so you need one of your own. You've got to go get washed in the sink. Look at Galatians 3, verses 23 and 24. Let me, let me get there in my Bible. Galatians 3, Galatians 3, verses 24, verse 20, chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Galatians chapter 3, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way to the New Testament, and then it's Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians 24. Paul says the purpose of the law, it was never given to make people righteous. You couldn't become righteous by keeping the law. What was the purpose of it then? Why did God give it to us? 
It says, therefore, the law was our tutor. What's a tutor? Someone eats too many beans? Uh, <laughs> should I edit that out? <laughs> What's a tutor? <laughs> More you tutor, the better you feel. It's a teacher, right? It's someone that guides you along and brings you to the place where you can understand and know what it is you are to know. Well, the Bible says that the law was our tutor. It was our instructor. It was our teacher in order to do what? Bring us to, Christ. to bring us to Christ. In the Old Testament, their Messiah, knowing that he was coming. Right. So that we might be justified by faith. God says the law can't save you, but it does provide a valuable resource so you can know yep. that you need a savior because you can't live up to the law. You can't keep the law. It's too hard. And if you don't keep everything in the law, you're uh, going to be righteous before God. Because if you break one of the laws, it's the same as breaking all of them, the Bible says. So we definitely need a savior. And so Paul says that this righteousness that comes from God, that has nothing to do with keeping the law, it's a gift that you can receive, was witnessed by the law and the prophets. One of the things that Paul was accused of in his day was coming up with some newfangled um, uh, system of a religion that had nothing to do with the Old Testament. But Paul says very clearly here that not only is that not true, the Old Testament, and that's what the law and the prophets is referring to, whenever it says law and the prophets, what it really means is the Old Testament. He says the Old Testament talked about this, that there would be a righteousness from God available to people that needed righteousness, which is all of us. It's going to be available. Where do you think, or can you think of, any place in the Old Testament where a righteousness from God, a righteousness provided by God that you don't have, was talked about? Any examples of that? Paul says, hey, it's in the Old Testament. Where would it be? Abraham. Okay, what about Abraham? Dennis says Abraham. Ah, uh, Abraham in the Old Testament, very famous person, uh, someone who the Old Testament and the New Testament Jews were very familiar with and looked up to. Was the law given to Abraham? Was the law around when Abraham was around? Did Moses come down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments on the tablets and Abraham read those somewhere? When did Abraham get uh, born and live? Before or after the law was given? Was yeah, a long time before. But God said he became righteous. Mm -hmm. How did he receive righteousness if there was no law? Because by faith, right? That's what I heard. Someone by said faith. by faith. Mm -hmm. Meaning? Believing God. Mm -hmm. He believed God and had nothing to do with the law or keeping any Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Well, Fred says that you hear people talk about faith all the time and being spiritual and um, a person that has a lot of faith in, in this or that or, you know, is it faith in anything that counts or is it a certain kind of faith? And, and, and Fred says that it's not just faith. It's faith in something, right? It has to be the right kind of faith. Faith in the one who can do something for you. If you have faith that that tree over there is God, that ain't going to do much good for you, is it? Or if you have faith in a religious system that you think is going to give you something that's going to make you acceptable to God, that's not worth anything. Because it has to be God who measures the value of your faith. And God says, faith that's real faith, that's going to get you a right standing before me, has to be a faith that represents what I say, what I tell you, you must receive and believe. When Abraham was justified by faith, it says that God appeared to him. 
We're going to read this in the next chapter in Romans. But God appeared to Abraham and said to Abraham, I'm going to give you something. And it wasn't the land. It was something much more important than that. What did he tell Abraham he was going to, what did God tell Abraham he was going to give him? He's going to give him descendants, right? Fred says a son. He said he was going to give Abraham the descendants as the stars in the sky. And from those descendants would come a Messiah. Did Abraham have any kids at that time? He didn't have any. How old was Abraham when God promised him that he would have descendants as many as the stars in the sky? Well, pushing 100 if he wasn't already there. He was close to 100 years old. But it was before Sarah was pregnant. Sarah didn't have any. Uh, yeah, Sarah wasn't pregnant. They didn't have any kids. Sarah was 90 years old. The Bible says that they were both past the age of having children. But God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you so many children that they're going to be as many as the stars in the heaven. And did Abraham go, that's impossible, God. I'm 100 years old. That birth? No. Did he believe him right away? Yeah. Okay, maybe it was Sarah. Who did yeah, Sarah's the one that said, Shh. I don't think so. But Abraham said, okay, God says so. I'm going to believe it. And God said that that faith, that faith in what, um, that that Abraham's faith in what God said, that's faith. That's what faith is. It saves you. That's what kind of faith makes you righteous before God. What does God tell us today? We must believe in order to be righteous before God. It's not that God's going to give us children. It's nothing like that. But he does tell us we need to believe something in order to receive forgiveness and righteousness before him. What is it? It's not paid at all. That's right. It is that God sent his son into the world. And his death is sufficient for our salvation to make us right before God. If we believe that, God will make it happen. And that's where faith becomes potent. Or status says it's believing what God has done for us in order to make us right before him. Now, there's some other examples. Remember Adam and Eve? Not personally, I'm sure. Maybe Fred remembers Adam. I don't know. <laughs> Adam and Eve, I mean, they sinned in the garden. What did God provide for them to make them acceptable to him? What did he give them? Hmm? That's the coffee maker. He did something. They were naked. He clothed them. He provided a covering for them. And then he also provided a sacrifice for them. See, God provided what they needed in order to be acceptable to God. And they had to receive the clothing and they had to receive the sacrifice, the lamb that they had to offer. And the same thing with Abraham. Remember when um, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac? And he took Isaac up to the mountain and God said, I want you to take your son, the one that I promised to you that all these descendants were going to come from, I want you to take him up there and kill him. Uh, wait a minute, God. If I take him up there and kill him, that means that I'm not going to have the descendants that you promised because you said it would come through Isaac. But if I kill him and sacrifice him, then how does that work? And the Bible says that Abraham thought this through. What do you think Abraham's conclusion was regarding God's request to go kill Isaac? That's exactly what Abraham thought because Abraham believed God's promise that Isaac is going to be the one through whom all my descendants are going to come. So if I kill him the way God says I'm supposed to, God's going to have to raise him from the dead. Okay, let's go, Isaac. I'm going to kill you, and I'm, God's going to raise you from the dead. I mean, that's really what Abraham was thinking. But when he got up there to kill Isaac, did God allow Abraham to kill Isaac? No, he didn't. 
What did God provide instead? He provided a sacrifice. He provided a lamb. God provided the remedy for the problem. And then moving forward, we come to the temple. What went on in the temple? What happened in the temple? Sacrifices, lots of them. Because without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there's no forgiveness of sins. And so, all of these sacrifices were brought because God said, if you bring them and you sacrifice these animals, then it will cover your sin. And so by faith, they received God's provision for their need. They became righteous because of their faith in what God said he would provide. They believed God. So notice in verses 22 and 23 of Romans, it says, even the righteousness of God or a righteousness from God, how do we receive this righteousness? It's through faith in Jesus Christ. To all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, how is this righteousness from God received? How is it received? Through faith. Through faith. We believe God. That's not our doing, though. Salvation is of the Lord. God's doing the business. Stannis says our faith is not our doing. Okay. We will get into that later. But it's through faith, not through works. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy, he saves us through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not just faith in something. It must be faith in Jesus Christ and what he did. And who is that available to? Everybody. Fred says it's good news because it's something you can't do for yourself, but God will do for you. He will give you a righteousness you don't have. He will make you acceptable to God in a way that you could never do it on your own. That's good news. I can't earn it. But he's got one for me if I want to accept it. So why can't mankind earn his righteousness before God by doing good things like going to church, praying, meditation, doing good deeds, following the Ten Commandments? Why can't we earn our righteousness that way? Why do we need to have a righteousness from God by faith? Because we can't do it. Go ahead and try it. You won't make yeah, it. Yeah, ain't going to make it. Just can't. Ain't going to have it. All right, so Paul goes on. He's saying, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption in Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. All right. This week's Sesame Street is brought to you by the words justified, redemption, and propitiation. What in the world do those words mean? They're big words. But Paul says we're justified freely by God's grace. All right. He says through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. First of all, what does it mean to be justified? We're justified before God. Mm -hmm. given, uh, made righteous. Stana says we're made righteous, we're made right. Think of it this way. I'm justified just as if I'd never sinned. Yes. When you are justified, it means that God sees you just as if you had never sinned at all. Never. Never. That's your standing before God. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ. He makes you perfect and whole as if you've never sinned at all. And it's through the redemption that's in Jesus Christ. Okay, so justified means just as if I'd never sinned. And it's through the redemption that's in Christ. What is redemption? You probably heard that term before. I'm redeemed, redeemed, da 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 da. Paid for, Fred says. Paid for. Paid for. Bought back by God. Bought back. Who did God buy us back from? The devil. That's right. We're actually under his control before we come to Jesus as our Savior. The devil has dominion over us. We belong to him. We're his property. 
You know, one of the most beautiful pictures of what redemption is, is found in Leviticus 25, 25. It's the law of the kinsman redeemer. Redemption means that God bought us back. We were sold into the slavery of sin and Satan, and he bought us back. It's interesting, in Leviticus 25, 25, God gives the Old Testament saints, the Jews, a law. It's called the law of the kinsman redeemer. Let me read that law to you. It's a beautiful picture of this word redemption. In Leviticus 25, 25, he says, if one of your brethren become poor and has sold his possessions, if he's poor, he's not going to be able to buy him back, right? He sold his possessions. Now, get this picture in your mind. You're a Jew. You're an Israeli. You own some property. You own some, some, uh, some things, but you run into hard times. Your wife has cancer. You got in a, uh, you know, a donkey cart accident and got sued or something happened, and you had to sell your property and sell your land to pay the bills, and now you've got nothing. But if you have a relative who's rich. That relative can redeem your property. In other words, he can buy it back for you. You can't buy it. You don't have any money. You've got nothing by which you could purchase back what you sold. But let's say Vern here is my Uncle Vern. I sold everything I have, and Uncle Vern shows up and says, you know, I feel bad for you. This property's been in the family for 300 years and you had to sell it. Let me make it good. And so Uncle Vern goes to the person who owns the property and says, I'm buying it back. He could do that. And the person would have to sell it back to him. He would say, I'm buying it back for my, my loser nephew, Robert. All right. So I'm buying it back. He had to sell it. And he can redeem what his brother, cousin, relative sold. That was the law of the kinsman redeemer. And it was a very, very wonderful law. It allowed people to get back what they might have sold if someone wanted to step in and buy it back. Now, this law was actually used in a very important way in the book of Ruth. Anybody familiar with the book of Ruth? What happened in the book of Ruth? Who was Ruth? Bird said that Ruth was a Moabite, a foreigner, right? The book of Ruth. Um, Bern summed it up very well. The book of Ruth was a story of a, a woman by the name of Naomi. She had three sons. Naomi's husband died. And they left the land of Israel because of, of famine. And, and uh, they had to go to a, another place called Moab. And there, her three sons married three Moabitess women. And those sons died. So now Naomi has three daughter-in-laws, but her husband died and her three sons died. All their property was sold back in Israel, so they had nothing, absolutely nothing. And Naomi decides to go back to Israel. Then, you know, I'm going back to my homeland. I got nothing there, but at least maybe my relatives will feed me. I mean, I can go to the temple and, 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 and beg if I need to. And none of the other daughters-in-law wanted to go back, except Ruth wanted to go back with Naomi because Ruth loved Naomi. So Naomi and Ruth went back, and Ruth went out into the fields to gather grapes and wheat because they, the poor were allowed to go into the field of rich farmers and, and gather what they could eat for one day. So Naomi sent Ruth out to go do that. And while Ruth was out, she just happened to end up in the field of a young man by the name of Boaz. And Boaz saw Ruth and went, whoa, hubba hubba, who's this, you know? Hubba up, yeah. That's, uh, I think it was, oi, oi. Yeah. 
Anyway, so he goes, who's that? And they said, well, that's Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth. And that was um, so-and-so's, um, uh, you know, owned this property that he had to sell. So um, Boaz said, ooh, that's interesting. What if I buy that property back? And they said, you can do that, but it comes with Ruth. Ruth comes with it. You know, the whole family comes with it. And he's like, that's what I'm shooting for. <laughs> he said, go buy back. There was someone that was a relative that was closer to Naomi than Boaz. Boaz was like a second cousin or something. He said, hey, you have the right to go buy that land that Naomi sold. And he was like, hey, yeah, I might do that. He said, oh, by the way, it comes with a girl. Yeah. He's like, I don't want to do that. I got a wife. I don't need a wife. He said, well, if you refuse, then I can take that place of the kinsman redeemer. And the man said, go, go do it. So Boaz went and bought back the land that Naomi had sold for Naomi. And in the process, Ruth became his wife. But the kinsman redeemer was a law that said, someone can buy you back and restore you to where you should be. Guess who our kinsman redeemer is? Jesus, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Amen. He bought us back. What did he use as collateral? What did he use to buy us back? He used himself. He says in verses 24 and 25 that we are justified. We are just as if we'd never sinned by grace through Jesus buying us back, whom God has set forth as a propitiation. Okay, here's another one, a big word, propitiation. What is propitiation? In the Old Testament, we talked about how the priest would go into the temple once a year, and he would take blood and put it on top of the ark. Remember that? The ark was a box. And inside the box were the Ten Commandments, a bowl of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. That's what was inside the ark. It was just a box covered with gold on top of the box. On top of the box. Fred says cherubs. On top of the box was a lid. And that lid had angels. Two of them. And their wings went out over the box and touched in the middle. If you've ever seen the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark, it's a pretty good representation in that movie of what the ark looked like. It was a box covered with gold, and on top were angels. You need a couple of rings on it. And there were some rings so they could carry it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. This box was called the mercy seat. That was the name of the covering of the box. And do you know what the Greek word for mercy seat is? Propitiation. Propitiation. <laughs> it's the Greek word propitiation. What Paul is saying here is that Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. He's, he's our mercy seat. What did the priest do once a year with this bowl of blood? He came in and he put it on the mercy seat. And that blood spoke to God and said, I am merciful and I will forgive your sins because of the blood on the mercy seat. The propitiation. That mercy seat was the propitiation. It was the place where God said, I see the blood, I will forgive. So in the Old Testament, you said, how did that happen? It happened because the people believed that God would forgive them 
because of the blood on the mercy seat. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. He is the one that God sees as the sacrifice for our sins. In His blood, you see, by His blood, when He shed His blood on the cross, that blood fulfilled all of the times that the priest put the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat. And God said, I will forgive the sins of the people because of the blood of Jesus Christ, which is our mercy seat, our propitiation. And it's a wonderful picture. You know, this whole term of redemption was something that uh, was very familiar to um, the Jews. You know, during World War and World War II, Civil War, the first two years of the war with, Link, uh, with the South, Lincoln repeatedly offered compensated emancipation to the border slave states that remained in the Union. He was trying to redeem the slaves. The slaves could not redeem themselves. Abraham Lincoln was trying to give money to the southern states in order for them to release the slaves. Lincoln wanted to buy them back, but they all rejected. Lincoln was willing to pay, but southerners were not willing to give up their slaves for money or for any other reason. You see, Lincoln wanted to redeem the slaves. God wants to redeem the slaves to sin. And he does it because they can't do it by themselves. So we saw what being justified means. We saw what redemption means. We saw what propitiation means. And we talked about that too. Now notice all these people standing in line. What do you think they're standing in line for? What is it? COVID what is it? shot. COVID shot? Burns says COVID shot. Yeah. Yeah, but they're not wearing their masks, so probably not. They're standing in line because it's free ice cream cone day. Free ice cream cone day. It's amazing what people will stand in line for if it's free. God says we are justified freely by his grace. We can be made as if we had never sinned by his grace. Why aren't people standing in line for what is God is giving away freely? Forgiveness and eternal life in heaven is free to anyone who will receive it. And Fred pointed out that what, why, why wouldn't they be standing in line for that, right? The devil, the devil and his lies. Okay, so the devil and his lies. What do you think, Bert? They don't want to give up their sin. They don't want to stand in line and be forgiven. They like their sin. Okay. They don't believe. They're not convinced that God will do it. They don't believe the story. They just don't believe that Jesus died for their sins. They don't believe it's true. They like their sin. Maybe they haven't heard. Maybe we're not doing a good enough job letting people know. Maybe, you know, maybe that can't be. It can't be that simple. I just come to Jesus and receive what he has done for me. In payment for my sins, he's my mercy seat. I just got to believe that he did that and God will forgive me. That's too simple. I can't believe that. It's got to be harder. I got to go through the sacraments. I got to go to church. I got to do X, Y, Z. I knew a guy that quit giving, gave up on church. Tried to go to church. Tried really hard to go to church and be good. Because they were telling him, you have to be good. You got to be this. You got to be that. You got to dress a certain way. You got to act a certain way. And he said, I can't do it. He realized that he couldn't do it and he quit. They weren't he teaching that it's a free church. gift. Exactly. They weren't teaching that it's a free gift from God because you can't do it on your own. And so he quit going. Okay, so God says in verses 25 and 26, or Paul says, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God passed over sins that were previously committed. Now, this is something Stana asked earlier. How did God forgive people in the past? If Jesus hadn't come and died on the cross, how could they be saved? Look at what it says. God passed over their sins. Not because they weren't sinners, but 
this whole process of sacrifice and blood on the mercy seat, God saved them by credit. God said, you believe me, I will pass over your sins for now. But when Jesus Christ comes and dies for the sins of the world, I will make credit to you what Jesus is going to do because you believe in what I said he would do in the future. And so God passed over their sin. He overlooked them because of their faith in the coming Messiah, the one who would come and sup, uh, pay for their sins. But today, you must believe in Jesus Christ as the propitiation, as the mercy seat, so that God might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God must be just, which means he must punish sin. Which means all of us deserve to go to hell. But because Jesus came and was the propitiation, the mercy seat, and bought us back, God can justify us even though we are sinners. And he can be righteous in doing so. Because Jesus did two things. Jesus lived a sinless life. Jesus never sinned. Not once. Not in his mind. Not in his behavior. Never did he commit a sin. He always did what God commanded any human being to do. He did it because he was God. He was human, but he was God in the flesh. So he was sinless. So he could pay the price for sin. Even though he was not a sinner, he paid the price for those who were sinners. Through Christ, God punished sin because he punished Christ. So that God could forgive the sinner who comes to Christ. See, Jesus never sinned. He could have walked right back into heaven, but he died for you and he died for me so that God now says, I will forgive you because I already paid for the sin. He paid your sin. He paid your price. You can be forgiven. So God can still be just. The price has been paid, just not by you. And because Jesus lived a sinful life, a sinless life, not sinful life, start that one over. Because Jesus lived a sinful life. <laughs> because Jesus lived a sinless life, he earned a righteousness we can't achieve because he lived and fulfilled every law that God ever placed on man. He was righteous. And he gives that righteousness to you and to me when we come to God by faith. So two things happen when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You receive forgiveness of all of your sins because of what Jesus did on the cross. So you're forgiven of everything. And then God gave you His righteousness, like a coat that you put on over your dirty rags. It's His righteousness. So that when God sees you, what He sees is someone who's forgiven and clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful, and it's free. By faith. So, that is chapter 3. Now, next time we'll look at chapter 4, and God begin, or Paul begins to give us some examples of, of the Old Testament in Abraham, how Abraham demonstrates God's forgiveness through faith and his righteousness that is available to any and all that come to Christ. So we're going to pray. Any 